founder of Edgy Labs. We are a state-of-the-art enterprise SEO company, really focused on driving organic traffic on the web with artificial intelligence and uh, implementing sophisticated strategies for our clients and partners, which are some of the largest in the world, and really uh, pleased that many of them are here today with us. Artificial intelligence, as we've talked about uh, today, is really transforming the way that we work, live, and learn. With advancements in machine learning, natural language processing, and computer vision, it's really being developed into something that can handle highly complex tasks. In terms of day-to-day, -day, I think everybody is embracing AI. A lot of us have smart home devices like Siri, Alexa, and Google Home that are controlling our lights and making our homes more energy efficient. We're even going to talk a little bit in a moment about how AI is working on our freeways and our air traffic control systems by making those flows more efficient as well. Um, also, artificial intelligence is changing the way that we learn and implicating the education system, the way that people acquire knowledge, study, the way that platforms are providing very personalized tutoring and guidance, and really allowing children and people to learn more effectively and efficiently. The benefits of AI are tremendous, but there are also some major concerns about the negative impacts on society. For example, job displacement in certain industries where artificial intelligence might be taking away different jobs and human capital. There's also negative implications of AI being misused in the wrong hands. And I think that it's a very fascinating but very complex topic. I think we all have a societal duty to ensure that it's developed with the right ethical standards and principles of fairness, accountability, and transparency. Now, I'm very pleased to uh, welcome this incredible panel. And what I'd like to do is start with Anna if you'd please introduce yourself. Sure, thank you, thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, one more Brazilian freezing in this environment, so I, I relate a lot with the comments before me. So, uh, first of all, my name is Ana Fleury. Uh, I've been with PepsiCo for the last nine, well, actually, this year is gonna be my 10th anniversary. Um, so, very happy to be here, and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, before that, I was working consulting. I've done almost 20 years uh, in managing consulting uh, in both companies, IBM and PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, and obviously, PepsiCo was one of my customers, one of my clients. So I changed, you know, from one side to the other side, and uh, loved loved the experience. Um, I think that's it. Marco, will you please introduce yourself? Yes. Oh, the, first of all, it's a big pleasure to be here with the brilliant minds and the high-level professionals. It's uh, so good. It's very nice. I'm Marcos Tadeu de Freitas. Everyone call me Tadeu. It's more easy. If you call me Marcos, I think that I get a mistake, and this probably it's my wife correcting me. No? <laughs> uh, I, I, I have been working in 20 years in the Brazil in the sales. I work the customer management, trade marketing, employees, they have a strategy engage about their sales teams. At this year, I complete 15 years old in the Nestle, and across my career in the Nestle, I have the opportunity to pass for the 13 positions in all the countries, the regions for the Brazil, in all the categories, in all the channels. And currently, I am a sales director for e-commerce in the sales division for Nestle Brazil, responsible for the B2B and B2C strategy. And, uh, it's, uh, I think that's my background. Awesome. I wanted to start just with our first question. Um, obviously, all today we've been talking about generative AI and artificial intelligence, and it really has incredible capabilities. But I think what's so important is, how is it really affecting your business and your industry probably in the next 12 months? What's around the corner that you can see? 
Yeah, uh, so I forgot to mention, I lead IT for Latin America at PepsiCo. I forgot to mention my, my function there. Um, so I think, let's start with a little bit of, the, of what is PepsiCo, right? So I hope I don't have to explain much, and I think most of you have had the experience of tasting or, or drinking one of my products. So we are uh, one of the leading companies in foods and beverages. And we actually have some iconic brands like, you know, Lay's, Doritos, Tostitos. Um, in Latin America, we also have some local brands. So Sabritas, Gamesa for my friends here from Latin America, uh, and also Elma Ships in Brazil. Quaker, Gatorade, Pepsi Cola for sure, Mountain Dew and others. So I'm sure uh, each one of you have already experienced some, some of our products and I hope had, had been a very uh, good experience. So uh, this is PepsiCo. It's a global company. Um, you know, we are scattered around basically all the countries. Uh, in Latin America, it's over 30 countries. Um, and our ambition is to become more and more intelligent company, as we all want, right? Um, our digital transformation strategy goes from what we call the consumer all the way back into uh, agro. Not many people know, but we are very much into agribusiness because our products are food, food and beverage, so we need the agricultural side of the business. So what we have been doing is actually uh, applying artificial intelligence to most of our, actually to the entire value chain of our company. And as I mentioned, first starting with consumers. Why consumers? Because we are a consumer-centric company. We live and breathe the consumers. So what we need to do there, because consumers are becoming more and more digital, more demanding, they are you know, asking for better products, for more availability of our products, and we need to you know, fulfill those demands. And in that sense, we have to, first of all, understand the consumer. So I think you were mentioning a lot about consumer, and I loved your statement of saying, we have to understand, we have to map their behaviors to understand what we need to do as a company. And this is what we are trying to do, applying you know, technology to better understand consumer behaviors and be able to map it inside and see what we need to do to fulfill those needs. And, and those consumers are demanding, as I mentioned, better products. Better products mean we have to have higher quality in our products. How do we do that? Then it's the second stage of my value chain. I have to go inside and see how I can create the perfect Cheetos. How do we make a perfect Cheetos? Anyone here would guess what is needed to make a perfect Cheeto? What? Flavor? What else? Time of cooking, maybe? Yes. The processing and Pressure, manufacturing. Pressure, exactly. Crunch. What else we, you as consumer would value? Freshness, no? Freshness, absolutely. There's a ton of you know, characteristics that are needed for us to make this perfect product, the product that the consumers want to consume. And they love the brands and they love the products. Not all, only about brands, it's about the product quality. And so for that, Interestingly, there's many, many parameters or settings that we have to you know, manage inside a factory, inside a manufacturing plant. And this means a lot of you know, machines and a lot of knowledge from our you know, operators, our plant operators. So what we are doing is really trying to bring this knowledge into technology so we can consistently, and that's the name, consistently create the perfect shiros or the perfect lace. And that means really to have precision into the manufacturing process. And this is what we're trying to do with artificial intelligence. So we are augmenting our workforce in a way that we have better information, better insights, and a better, a better manufacturing process. So this is one side. That solves for the product quality. But one of the key aspects of the product is also the ingredients. So I didn't mention ingredients, but ingredients, which means raw materials, are really necessary. And we have to seek for quality. 
And this is where the agro side of the business is coming uh, along, because as you might imagine, we have many different countries with different climates, with different, you know, um, even agricultural uh, practices. And that gives us a lot of diversity into the environment where we actually source our main raw materials. So what we need to do is also to apply, and we have been doing that, applying our you know, technologies, and AI in particular, to understand the soil, to manage our crops, to start having a better you know, vision of how we are getting the best quality of our raw materials. But I did not mention two important things about the manufacturing process and the sourcing process. It's not only about quality of our products and raw material, but it is also about better managing the use of resources. So when I come to my factory, I want to see the optimized way to consume utilities. We don't want to overspend, on the contrary. We want to be very conscious. So this is the other side of our strategy at PepsiCo. It's not only about fulfilling my customer, but it's also about making good things for the planet, you know, managing the, the natural resources in a very responsible way. And also in the agro, so it's not only about getting the best raw material for my product, in terms of quality, but it's also about leveraging technology to better manage the use of natural resources, water, fertilizers, anything that I, can, that I have to do in my agricultural business needs to be very responsible. And this is what we call re regenerative agriculture, because we, we want the planet to be good enough for us to live here. So those are the three pillars where I can, you know, leverage, where we are leveraging technology to, you know, uh, get the better product and fulfill my customer and consumer needs. Last but not least, we have our people. It's not only about consumer centricity, it's about employee experience and employee centricity. So we are also leveraging, you know, AI and technologies to get best experiences to our employees. We want to empower our people in a way that they can be more creative, more productive, and feel good about working at PepsiCo. We have a, response, a very, very uh, you know, deep responsibility to create a better environment for our people inside PepsiCo as well, and technology is helping a lot. That would be Anna, it. thank you. Yes. Tade, if you'll tell us your perspective uh, working with Nestle and in your industry, how you think AI will uh, be used in the next 12 yes, months. Yes, Thank you. Uh, I, I would like to break down, to share the two dimensions, two topics about the influence thought that you have the AI for the next 12 months. And the first is about the communication. It's about the, all the platforms that you have to engage the teams, to engage the, all the chain that you have. Imagine in an industry like a food and beverage, you have a farms, you have uh, all the ecosystem about the manufacturing. You have a supply chain support, all the chain. You have a promoter team, sales teams, brand teams, and you have uh, many people involved to bring the products for the farms, for the table of the food for the people. No? And I think that intelligence artificial, it's a, a big opportunity to sustain and coordination the information in all the channel. Imagine uh, support, agricultural support for the farmer. Imagine uh, support about the merchandising for execution in the stores. Imagine support about the communication for the sales team. We have 10,000 people involved in the sales team in direct channel in the Nestle Brazil. If you have, if you can to coordinate all the strategy for communication and the best way identifying each part of the channel, for me, it's very important for the next months to understand. It's not only communication, it's not only information. It's coordinating and use AI to produce for the, each party, each employee, the best information uh, since for him. And the, another topic is about the predictability, the forecast. You need a very, very data. Everybody talked about data. The data is a uh, principle, but what, what can I do? What can I use the data? We have very important part about the data. It's about the 
inteligência artificial for produce predictability results. We can choose previews, we can view, have a forecast about the what's happened with my sellout in the two next months. I have information about the campaign promotion, I have information about the weather, I have information about the price, about my KPIs for execution. I have, weather, uh, I have knowledge in the Nestlé, uh, what's the way to operation the sales. If you put all these informations in the big data and don't working to improve, to identify the relationship that you have in the different variables that you have in the process, it doesn't matter. It's important to coordinate the information and join the results that I have for cost, for, for forecast for our results and produce the correct communication with our teams involved in this process. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to introduce you to our next panelist, uh, Japjeet from Matterport. Thanks, Gary. Um, so I'm going to keep the introduction short. We'll, we'll talk about the questions here uh, very shortly after that. I actually am also from a warm weather climate. So I, I live in Hawaii, uh, lived in California for the longest time, um, working at large, larger companies. It's kind of funny to hear people talking about 100-year-old uh, companies. Uh, you know, I work for a startup which is 10 years old uh, at best. So it's always a, a very different mindset when you kind of walk into that. Uh, Matterport is a um, 3D AI company from, from its core, computer vision at its very core. I actually asked ChatGPT to write me a um, uh, speech. So um, if you go to the next slide, please, I think you might see that speech. I'm not going to obviously read it to you, but I don't know, maybe the next one after that. Um, and then the only other thing I'll tell you is like over time, over the last probably 15 years, I've spent time in machine learning, deep learning um, uh, across various companies from Google to Microsoft, if folks have used Google Analytics, um, very proud of the work that the team did there. Um, I also worked on YouTube long form media. I'm pretty sure most people have used YouTube over the years. Um, that was fun uh, to product ads, search, uh, natural language understanding. Pause there. And I believe you scanned this room uh, a little bit earlier today, so maybe we'll see that work. Uh, I did scan later. the room, so I'll, I'll send it out uh, in, in probably another hour here. So, Awesome, thank you. Um, I wanted to introduce you now to uh, Marco from Sea Ridge. Yeah, thank you, Gary, and thanks for the introduction. My name is Marco Rickert. I work for Sea Ridge Technologies. Um, I'm the VP of technology for Sea Ridge Technologies, and just to introduce the company a little bit, we're not a 100-year-old company. We are a relatively small company, 75 people globally. And what we provide is computer systems for air traffic management. And air traffic management is one of those industries that not a lot of people touch. Airlines is a different game, but uh, air traffic management is really the people behind the scenes that direct air traffic. That can be air traffic control officers staffed by organizations such as the FAA or NAF Canada in Canada, for example. But it can also be airport operators and even airlines controlling the apron management of um, terminals or entire airports. Um, what Searage really provides is a visual line of sight enhancement. So we install CCTV cameras around the airfield and we provide that visual information to the controllers in, in order for them to do their job more effectively or from a remote location. So it could be controlling the airport from 500 kilometers away at a more convenient location for your staff or it could be like what we do in Hong Kong, controlling a third runway which the controllers no longer can see from the tower using digital technology. And the company was founded in 2006. We were the first ones to bring operational video into a control tower and also the first ones to operationalize AI in an airport. Um, now we're owned by Nats, which is the UK-based uh, air navigation service provider controlling all the airspace at 14 towers in, in the UK. Personally, as a VP of technology, I'm responsible for all of our software development, making sure we adhere to all the safety standards and also our technology roadmap and, and, and accountable for achieving that five-year roadmap vision. Thank you. As a pilot, by the way, Marco's my hero, so. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, so, JJ, I wanted to ask you, many schools are banning the use of AI, ChatGPT, and other forms of artificial intelligence. I think what we've seen, and I know I've learned from my children who are now, you know, young adults, you have to embrace new technology just like we had to embrace social media. Definitely has positive positives and negatives. What do you think are some of the boundaries that we need to put in place so that kids can use artificial intelligence productively to learn more effectively? 
Um, I don't know if there are boundaries that I can think of just for the moment. To me, this is equivalent of saying, you know, 600 years ago, we should ban books because everything should be said from, you know, word of mouth and you should only learn from the teacher and that's the only way to go about it. So I feel like there's a version today of, um, you know, asking a question 20 years ago, 25 years ago, Google came around and search became, you know, kind of democratized for everybody. You could go in and search for something. Um, to me, chat GPT is an, or large language models is a is the next generation evolution of being able to say, hey, by the way, don't just search or don't make me search. Give me an answer that is a little bit more comprehensive uh, at the end of the day, like make a judgment call. You're, the system's making a judgment call on your behalf, um, so to speak. So, um, so that's just the general broader sense of the, uh, of the picture. But the part that I think is important is education will have to evolve. There is no way to now say that, did you get the right answer by researching it yourself, or did you just get the answer? Did you ask the person next to you to say, hey, give me an answer, and, and you wrote it down? Um, no different that, that, than today. You're just asking ChatGPT as your next buddy over. Uh, if you look at all, a lot of the code pilot, co-pilot type affairs, Office has a co-pilot now. GitHub has a co-pilot. I think you announced a co-pilot in AWS Compass today. has a co-pilot. Compass has a co-pilot. Everybody has a co-pilot, right? And so how do you actually solve that problem um, in, in essence? Maybe the last thing to say on this one is 100 years ago, you could be an expert in 10 different things. Today, you can be an expert of ophthalmology of the right retinal something. Um, it's very specialized. It's gotten a lot more, da lot more data about, you need to know a lot more data about whatever that right retina is going to look like. So how do you get and synthesize all that information? And I truly believe AI uh, or any kind of machine deep learning is gonna help you do that. The question is, can you evolve to learn versus evolve to get an answer, so. So I, I also know you have a few children. Have you had to have this conversation at all with them about AI and, and the different tools that are out there yet? Um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's fascinating. So um, we IPO'd last year, about 18 months ago, and um, I'm, you know, one of my, probably as a uh, dad, the proudest moment was my daughter came to me and said, I want to be a leader in technology, you know, after attending the IPO. I'm like, great. Uh, for the last 18 months, she's herself gotten really into computer science, and so she spends a lot more time than even I do sometimes, you know, writing code. Uh, so we have a lot of conversation about uh, computer science as a result. Um, and, you know, part of this is, it's a tool. It's like saying a computer is a tool, a book. We don't think about it today, but a book is a tool. Before there was an encyclopedia, what did you do? I actually don't know, I, it's a genuine question, like I have no idea what you, what you did before that. Uh, before you had search, you had Google search, what did you do? Anybody remember Gopher or Lycos? Yeah, there's like three people here who know what that even means. Uh, those, those were your search tools to actually go do that before, you know, uh, tomorrow they will be something else. And so one of the best parts about humans is we evolve or we don't. So, you know, it goes one way or the other. Yes, without a doubt. Uh, Marcos, I'd love to get your perspective on, you know, how AI and chat is going to balance the boundaries with learning and education. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Um, I, I think we don't know the boundaries right now. I think the only thing that we can do is we can provide guidelines, and I think it's our responsibilities as mentors and then teachers. We heard from a lot of good professors. I think it's our responsibility to teach the next generation how to use this tool. It is just a tool, it's a, it's a very powerful tool, but it's still a human in the end of the day that makes the final decision. So talking about our uh, industry, my industry specifically, the safety regulator doesn't, matter. It doesn't, doesn't care if it's a programmer that copied from Stack Overflow, generated with ChatGPT, it's always the responsibility of the programmer to make sure that that program is safe, that it's tested to a certain safety standard, and that it's then certified by, if Searage produces that piece of code, we are liable for its safety. Um, so I think overall, the boundaries we don't know today, the, the only thing we can do is, is evolve with it and make sure that we teach the students how to, how to use it and make sure that we fact check it 
and make sure that we embrace it as well because as we're talking about today, we are talking about the next generation of software engineers enabling to be more efficient, the super, the next super engineer. Um, so I think we have to bring that into schools as early as possible if we want people to understand how to use these and become more efficient going forward. Marco, thank you. Um, I wanted to introduce you to our next panelist, Paolo. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the invitations. I'm glad to be here. Well, I'm, my background is computer science, too, uh, as work as software engineer. Uh, actually, I, I work at Vivo. Vivo is a, trade, a telefonicas group trademark company uh, in Brazil. It's a leader of the market in Brazil. Uh, I, I work with uh, Aura. Aura is an AI platform of, of Vivo. It's, uh, in, it's, disponib it's available in the various channels in Brazil for, for uh, sales and customer attendance. Uh, with more than 30 million of the interaction for months. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to introduce you to our next panelist, uh, Felipe. Hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, a little bit of background on myself. Uh, I started my career in the financial market and financial sector. I worked for big banks like Deutsche Bank, uh, later on Santander also General Electric uh, Consumer Finance. Uh, I spent 11 years on the loyalty industry. In 2014, I co-founded Livelo, which is the biggest uh, loyalty program in Brazil right now, with 22 million customers. Uh, after that, I was the director for digital strategy for Santander for a couple of uh, years. And then I joined uh, DASA. DASA is the biggest healthcare provider in Brazil. Uh, we created an ecosystem connecting uh, doctors, patients, and uh, insurance companies. Um, and after that, since last week, I joined Compass. Uh, and I'm Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. And I'm the global uh, head for Gen AI Initiative. Uh, I'm really happy to be here talking to you guys. Awesome. Thank you. So, Paolo, I wanted to ask you, um, how do you feel AI is going to change and evolve in the next 12 months at Telefonico and Vivo? Sure. Um, it's not so easy to, to prediction about this because it's, it's very fast and change everything uh, all the time, you know, uh, because the chef GPT uh, transformed the AI system to be very easy to put in on, on, the, on the client side, you know, but it's not... Uh, totally true about this. Uh, at Vivo, we are working in a, in a partnership with Microsoft to, to use the, the Microsoft API uh, for ChatGPT to create some, some, some use cases for the call center, mainly, uh, to help the employees to get some information uh, very clicky and, and more assertive. Um, we are, we are working together to create a laboratory to innovation with using ChatGPT to transform some, some, some tools or uh, uh, create some tools for the sales, uh, salesperson or the uh, call center attendees, uh, loyalty programs, for example, uh, and other, other things that we could create together with Microsoft. Thank you very much. Felipe, I know you, with your new role, have a couple of things that you're working on. Uh, maybe you can share those with us a little. Yeah, I'm just going to start with some uh, study that we conducted in, uh, internally in Compass. Uh, we can more than double the performance of the, the single developer using uh, AI. Our vision of this would be uh, if our clients would be able to send us a voice uh, message through any uh, chatting software like WhatsApp, uh, we, if we could transform that into requirements, uh, store those requirements, and then uh, automatically 
uh, start to develop software, and the developer would play a role certifying that uh, the, the software developer was, was, is compliant and is delivering whatever uh, our client uh, wants. Uh, and all of that uh, orchestrated in a single platform. That's the, the idea behind the AI cockpit. Uh, in, in other words, uh, we are trying to orchestrate all the good tools that are already on the market. We are not uh, trying to reinvent the wheel here, but we have uh, really good specialized tools for each step of the development process of the software engineering uh, process. So we're going to leverage all those tools. We're integrated with the most common right now, and of course, researching and studying uh, the new uh, wave of uh, Gen AI that will come over the next months, and we will integrate that into the platform as well. So uh, putting that all together on a single platform that can uh, orchestrate all the process and give back information, important information for the management team uh, to, f to follow up on the, the, the workforce and AI initiative. That's our uh, main vision in AI cockpit that you're implementing right now. Great, thank you very much for sharing, really appreciate it. I wanted to hand it over to Anna. Um, I know you gave us uh, a really great overview of PepsiCo. Tell me some of the trends that you've seen in applications recently that you think will be the fastest to adopt. Well, I, I think as, as I, I was you know, mentioning to you guys, I think we have been through a journey that in the past was mostly related to you know, productivity. It was mostly related to process optimization. So this is what I think most of the companies were going through. This was the beginning of the so-called digital transformation. And this is what we all embarked in a very massive way looking for a mostly productivity and cost reductions. Uh, today, we have been augmenting cognitive automation. So we've been augmenting in intelligence to the process. So it's not only about automating, but it's really evolving automation into a very intelligent way of working. Um, and this is where I think we have applications. We've been, as I mentioned, applying this, let's call, augmented uh, you know, brain uh, to everything we do, if possible, right? So uh, again, it's from in my case, from consumers all the way back to, to agro. And there's so many use cases that we actually can tap into. Uh, you can imagine a very a heavily manufacturing you know, uh, industry like mine. You have so many areas of opportunity uh, to really be more intelligent and at the same time regenerate much better experiences to being our consumers or our employees. So I think in general, we have tons of opportunity to, to keep being more intelligent in everything we do. And this is what we are looking for, honestly. It's really tapping into every single place of our value chain um, and understanding what are the opportunities that will allow us not only to be more efficient, which is a consequence, but also create better experiences, create better lives for our people as well, because at the end of the day, we want people to go home earlier and to be able to deliver more. So this is all we, ha we are targeting, and I'm sure in Nestle it's no different, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. No, it's the same, it's the same uh, about the, the manufacturing, the, the future for the AI in our chain for produce, but uh, I, I, was like to, I would like to talk about the the sales division and about the trend for the retail and the distribution management in the Brazil, because it's my core. Uh, I electric engineer by training, but I am a sales guy, no? Uh, in the Brazil, it's uh, very important to understand the movement that you have in the B2B platforms for the attendance for the additional tenure, because Brazil is a country, it's a, a big, big country. You have a many different cultures in their each regions, if you analyze the portfolio strategy, the Northwest, it's totally different when you compare to the Southwest and you talk about the same channel, traditional, proximity channel, okay? It's very, very important to understand why the way you have in the B2B, the World Compass and WebJump is a partner with the Nestle in the development of the B2B in the Brazil, but why can I put information and intelligence artificial to help the sales team? But the big challenge that I have in here 
and now at this my moment, it's what I can to engage the sales team. Don't afraid about the I. I lose my position because the computer is, is grow up and uh, take out my 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 job. It's important to understand what's the tools and what's to engage the two teams, incentives, campaigns, but the principal is transparency and communications. Because everybody in here know and want to know what's happening in the future, what's happening with my position. It's very, very important to think about the people and what's the technology help the people in their performance, but in you grow up your personal job too. Thank you. Um, I wanted to give the next question to Marco. Marco, you told me uh, a little bit earlier today about a really cool project that you guys are working on at the Hong Kong airport. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. So, so Hong Kong is actually the, the biggest project that we had in, in company history. We've installed 230-odd uh, 4K cameras that are streaming video from all around the airport. Um, for both air traffic control and airport operators and, and this is quite a unique project in the entire industry because traditionally the air traffic management industry has been um, sort of plagued with data silos. So airline has some data, airport have some data and then the air traffic controllers have some, some data as well. Sometimes they share data if, if governments regulate them to do so but um, really there's a lot of data silos. So what we were able to do in Hong Kong is we deployed our digital um, platform to drive digital transformation both for air traffic control and for the airport operator. So for example, one use case of that is that the air traffic controllers can now see what's going on at the gate. Is there a delay with the fueling? Is there a delay with baggage handling? Is there a delay with passengers coming on? And what that allows them to do is, is change the way that they assign gates so that, for example, if, uh, let's say, gate B23 has a delay of 10 minutes, but gate B24 is empty, I can shift my next aircraft to the next gate, whereas traditionally that information sharing wasn't happening from, from the airport that assigns the gate to air traffic control that directs the traffic. Do you, do you guys utilize that technology with American? Because American <laughs> tends to like get into DFW like 10 minutes early, and I'm like, you didn't tell them that we were coming? They didn't like figure it out? Um, keep going though. Yeah, f funnily enough, actually, we, we have a big system in LaGuardia where Delta manages, and in the US, sometimes the, the airline manages apron, apron control. So actually, Delta uses our, our virtual ramp control system in LaGuardia to do exactly that. And, and funnily enough, I came to Boston yesterday, and the first thing that I heard from my pilots said, Sorry, the gate is busy, we have some ramp control issues. I said, Well, I have the solution for that. <laughs> okay. I have a new client I need to introduce you to in Dallas. <laughs> um, I wanted to hand it now to JJ. JJ, if you could just share a little bit about your industry and business and really what you see as some of the changes that are going to happen relatively quickly using AI. Um, the, the interesting part now is uh, the rate of change, as is always the case, you know, has probably doubled. The last stat that I remember was something from IBM which talked about rate of change of knowledge was doubling every decade or so, and that was in, you know, prior to 2000. Um, they had thought that by 2012, it will be doubling every year, which I believe it is, and somewhere in 2030, it will be doubling every hour. It's exponentially changing how much data that you're gonna be able to harness. I was gonna to add to Anna's point earlier, um, every time somebody talks about an augmented brain, I, I kind of picture brain up top that is sitting over your head and kind of sifting information that's coming down based on your preferences uh, and kind of learning what you're, you're interested in and then helping. There's problems with that. There's going to be bias built in as a result of that. So, you know, we got to guard against those things. Um, and your personal bias as well, like, will kind of start to filter in over time. So how do you get the opposite side um, off the argument, making sure that that's happening. We don't do enough of that in the country, I think, or most countries, um, and the geopolitical side, but we won't talk about that today. Um, so there's, I think the aspects of quote unquote AI are gonna change. Um, they have been over the last 20 years. We just don't see them anymore. They were magic when they first happened. Um, today, you know, chat GPT feels like magic. Tomorrow it'll be something else. And so it's just a nature of, of the beast. We're going to evolve uh, the, the computing systems. Um, akin to this, a lot, you know, it's kind of hard to tell you now, but if you look back in history of, of computing, it kind of started in 1940s. 
In 2015, GPUs really made a huge inroad, kind of accelerated what we're seeing today. So what you're seeing with ChatGPT today really kind of kicked off in, in 2015. At that point, neural networks were what really kicked into gear and, and were making it available for you to do, at that point, what was called adversarial networks. These are now generative networks. Um, there will be symbiotic networks coming up here soon. Um, and then compute with large language models like just has gotten to a place where you could actually do that compute. Uh, the thing that they, you don't hear is how much time and energy did it take to actually you know, do chat GPT 1, 2, 3, 4, and 4.5 and um, in terms of time to actually generate that language model. It takes a lot of time and energy to actually go do that. So um, there will be something new that will come along. But what's cool is on my laptop, I have image generation, chat generation, so I basically Google on my laptop, um, as well as speech, just running locally on my machine, which is pretty insane. So from a version of where we were just even, you know, a couple of years ago to today, that has accelerated quite a bit. Uh, Felipe, I know you've had a lot of exposure to AI and, and leading the charge with Compass. Tell us a little bit about what you think we're going to see in like the next six months, some of the fastest emerging trends. I think we're going to totally uh, disrupt the, the software engineering uh, industry. Uh, we haven't captured yet the potential of the, the, the AI on this industry. I'm going to I strongly believe that over the next weeks we're going to start to, uh, uh, to get to know the real potential of that. But as soon as, as, as much as I uh, um, study and read and, and, and test the technology, I got even more scared of the potential of that. Uh, of course, we have to, to be careful about the creation of the, the AI. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, roadblocks that we might encounter over the, the, the path, but I strongly agree that the technology that we have today, the hardware that we have today available, uh, we, we couldn't think about that uh, five, ten years ago. So that's what's opening our windows, our windows uh, to the world right now. So I expect a huge change. I think protecting it is, is really important as well. I actually wanted to invite uh, uh, Mike Umansky, if you can come join us. Uh, Mike's CEO of Edgy. And I just wanted to, as we're looking at quick emerging fast trends, just a couple things that we wanted to share about kind of what's next and around the corner. Mike, thank you for joining us yeah, unexpectedly. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Um, when Gary and Alexa said, hey, I should jump on the panel today, I. Uh, I said, great, I've got about 20 slides we could go through on generative AI. And I said, no, no, no. You get two slides, two minutes, just kind of go through what we're working on. So um, when we started Edgy, what, seven years ago, uh, we were really focused on understanding how AI was going to impact content marketing. And I was very much driven by what you were just talking about, JJ, the, the concepts behind um, uh, G, uh, uh, what Google was doing and what was happening with uh, neural networks. Uh, that evolved really, really rapidly. And um, interestingly, we're, we're looking at what's happening uh, now with the new Web3. So history of, of, um, of the web really started in, in 1990 through uh, 2004, where it was really static web, people bringing brick and mortar onto their... Um, onto the web, and then that obviously dynamically changed in 2004 and into today. And so you had Facebook and e-commerce and all these things kind of come up. Today, 2023, we're really being able to unlock a lot of the, the, the value of GPT. So we're, we're thinking about things like the, the use cases you all are talking about, um, writing fast and code and things like that. If you, if you look at it at a kind of a macro level, there's a amount of, um, of value being unlocked with generative AI. So there's a lot of concepts today. Everyone's talking about personalization. What does personalization really mean? Well, um, that will be further unlocked with, with generative AI and what's going to happen with Web3. Um, there's a lot of work that's going to be done around um, just e-commerce 
right, conversational, asking it a question, how is it gonna answer that question back to you? And so what we've been thinking about and we've been working on with Edgy, if we go to the next slide, is really making sites conversational. And this concept of the challenges that that causes, things like security, reliability, compliance, the sheer fact of when you have uh, a conversational website and you're using something like uh, ChatGPT, sorry, ChatGPT or Google Bard or managing any of those interfaces, how is that going to actually work? And so there's, uh, well, we at Edgy are working through um, building services for use cases and then putting them inside of a platform that will allow all of our customers and users to be able to go out there and actually create these websites that are secure, that are reliable, that are conversational in nature. And that will unlock a lot of the value of where we're going with Web3. So it's really exciting to be on this panel and listening to what all you guys are doing because it's yeah. like, it's, it's just really uh, the, the next evolution kind of of what the, uh, um, of where we're going with this, with Gen AI. If I may add, uh, it's actually an interesting problem. So I have a really good uh, friend, colleague. He and I disagree on everything. So it's a, it's a natural, natural state of affairs. And we talk about browse-based uh, web versus you know, search or chat-based web. And how do you actually answer? Like, I'm an engineer in general. Uh, though most people think I'm, a, I, I'm in marketing for some reason. I don't know why. My whole family thinks I I'm think in marketing. I think you're good at the, yeah. Um, anyhow. Um, and it's interesting, it's like he will argue all day long that browse-based experiences are still the way to go. Whether it's based on Web3 or it's Web2, immaterial at that point. Uh, and, um, you know, chat is great. We actually worked on a, uh, one of my last companies at eBay. We worked on ShopBot for specifically that. Can we do shopping based on chat? Can we understand your query well enough to, to be able to answer this in a you know, pretty meaningful fashion. Um, and I think the, the answer is now you can understand the query, but the question is do you have the inventory to give you the, the answer back that you want, or are you gonna show back the same old results because yeah. that's what you got, like what you, you sell what you got. So it, it really just depends though. So. Yeah, well I think what's really interesting, and I think um, GPT-4 really unlocked a lot of that stuff, right? So what, what's, um, what we're seeing with GPT-4 is that this idea of, um, dynamic server-side generation is actually available. And it's not, we're not quite there, but it's gonna happen this year. I think by the end of this year, you're gonna start seeing these things. And um, what's, what's really interesting about it is, I think it's not browser-based versus chat-based. I think you're gonna still see a combination thereof. And it's how do you prepare your, your site, your brands, your, um, and even from a consumer perspective, it's like how do you create the best possible consumer experiences and that's what's going to be, that is what's happening today. But what, um, what's super interesting, in, in my opinion, is that it's not just GPT, right? It's Google Bard, it's Facebook. Everyone's going to have what we're calling a, AI interfaces or A2 interfaces, right? And as a brand, if you think about it, uh, GPT doesn't have a long-term or short-term memory. Like, it doesn't know what happened yesterday, and it's not really supposed to. So it's incumbent upon us as businesses to actually give the, the large language models, all of them, not just one at a time, but all of them through these interfaces, the information they need to have real-time data so that you can keep them up to speed. So it's just the future of where search and content marketing are going. Yeah, I think another really important thing, as Mike was sharing about how uh, ChatGPT is really scouring the entire web. The future down the road is going to be building your own language models for your own business. You are the, the king and queen of your own domain with the, the knowledge base that you have and then feeding that into this conversational interface and then getting it out to consumers. So, Felipe, did you want to add anything? Okay. No, I was uh, uh, discussing here that the I think the, the two worlds of uh, browser-based and Google-based search and, and uh, uh, conversational model have to coexist. They, they don't need to compete between uh, them. We have to learn how, do, how can they uh, combine to be more than, than just a single part. 
Well, I, uh, I know we're running out of time. I just really wanted to thank Compass and everybody here attending today, and I want to thank my incredible panelists. Thank you guys very much. It's been absolute pleasure getting to know you, building up to this experience, uh, and I know that the, w the world will continue to transform and AI will be a big part of it. So thank you so much for joining us today.